Right, well, thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here today. My very first lecturing job ever was to police officers about policing, uh, which from an ex-probation officer was a massive challenge, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I'm hoping that today I'll just raise some of the uh, issues that look as if they'll be discussed uh, throughout the rest of the day. So uh, all being well, um, I'm going to throw some points out for you to think about. First thing I'd like to say is that um, I think public protection is an extraordinarily difficult job. It's a really hard job. I've been doing it all my working life. I'm only 35. You can see the impact this sort of work has. Um, it's difficult because the expectations are so high of the public, of the media, of, of politicians. The costs uh, of failure are usually tragic. And the blame attached to that supposed failure um, often outweighs the blame that should be attached to the real villain of the piece, the perpetrator. And, and you'll all know that. You'll all have come across uh, similar things to that. It is a huge topic, um, and in case I run out of time, which I, I may well do, uh, I thought I'd tweet it just to uh, prove that I'm somewhere in touch with modern technology. Uh, and I think within that, uh, that tweet, 150 characters, uh, there is just about everything there is to know in many ways about public protection, I think. That's, um, that's what it involves. So I'll, I'll just leave that up there for you. My feeling is that the phrase public protection it's too easily bandied about without us really thinking through uh, what it means. As a result, I think there are issues with some of the terms. Uh, I think Rick's already mentioned one. I heard him from behind the curtain. Uh, we're using today uh, vulnerability, public, and protection. Uh, so I'd briefly like just to express a couple of issues with, with those terms before I move on uh, to discuss some other matters. For me, uh, much of the public protection uh, rhetoric concerns our vulnerability, uh, true, or more popularly, innocence. Uh, and I'm sure many of you will read and have read news reports where innocent people have been victims of uh, horrendous crimes. But again, I, I worry, what criteria do we use in defining these terms? Who is the we? Uh, my suspicion is that it is too often the media and it therefore becomes a moving feast. They dictate um, deserving. They just dictate innocence. They dictate, uh, to a large extent, vulnerability. Uh, my feeling is notion, it's wrapped up in notions of being a deserving and innocent victim. It's these categories uh, who attract the most emphatic public protection response, I feel. My media problem with this is what about those not coming in to those uh, categories? Are they less worthy uh, of protection? Do we have to make choices? Vulnerability itself uh, is due to a range of personal and social causative factors which, if not responded to as part of a wider protection package, render the task of protecting the public all the more difficult. And don't forget that a lot of the factors that make people vulnerable are also risk factors when you get into risk assessment. And they can problematize that person uh, up the risk scale. So there are real issues about uh, the words we use, the way we use them. When we move on to um, consider the public, what do we mean by the public, I think the problems mount uh, even more. 55 million people in England and Wales, can we protect them all? What if we lay a vulnerability over those 55 million? What does that do? We've got 10 and a half million uh, children and young people under the age uh, of 15, nine and a half million people over the age of 65, do they slip into more or less <coughs> vulnerable groups? Dig deeper, uh, and you often hear judges um, also de defining in many ways what the public is, which I think is quite interesting for members of the judiciary to do. Um, when they do that, they often say that certain offenders do not pose a threat to the public. And they often say this um, after they've uh, passed sentence in a domestic case, to, to use that particular term. If you think about, for example, uh, the overturning of the uh, indeterminate sentence for public protection passed on Jason Owen, 
for his involvement in the death of baby Peter. Uh, he won his appeal and the uh, judge made it clear that the, the wider risk to the public um, from Owen uh, was a step too far. In other words, he did not uh, present a sufficient risk to the public for an indefinite sentence. And it just seems to me that for a moment there, uh, baby Peter was not a member of the public. Uh, and that really does concern me. Um, the differentiation between the same types of offences, the same types of crimes, let's say violence or sexual assault, but in different contexts, uh, I think does much to frame our public protection response. I think it leads to, to difficulties, some of which I'll return to later. Finally, in, in the brief review of terminology, because that's what I'm still doing, uh, we come to protection. This usually popularly means uh, keeping from harm or, or safety. That's the opposite of danger, obviously. But can we really uh, achieve that with all the offenders, even those on the, the map of caseload, 65,000? That's one heck of a lot of people to try and protect. And then we have those who enter for the first time in an explosive manner. We don't know anything about them. Bang, they're there. Ten people are dead. Uh, we can't prevent that because we don't know about that uh, very often. So um, the, the use of the terms, I think, worries me. In public protection policy, protection itself relates quite specifically to future behaviour, to future harms. It is much less about what has already happened unless uh, we use it to inform the future. We seek to alter what we predict the future to be. So we make a prediction and then we try to change it. We try to manage it and try to make it safe. That's what public protection is. Predicting human behaviour. You deserve a medal if you're trying to do that. That's an enormously difficult task. However, as, as you all know, we've entered the world of risk assessment uh, and risk management in a big way. And that's uh, with a view to making that task of predicting the future a little easier. But as we grow increasingly dependent upon risk assessment tools, we need to be aware of their pitfalls and not forget some of the basic human instincts which are developed over time as a response to danger. I do recognise that is a, a terribly old-fashioned position. Danger, of course, comes in um, a whole variety of forms these days, and, and uh, the slide's just giving you a, a few of them. The Bouncing Book, of course, is an excellent read. I thought I'd just throw that up there. So a little bit of self-publicity occasionally, but it's, it's always changing. It never settles. You, when you're predicting the future, let alone predicting people, the various forms of danger make life very, very difficult. You're all constantly being asked to do more for less, but more in this case is beyond your control uh, in, in certain circumstances. You can't set that agenda uh, or, to, or, or control it. But what you can do, of course, is be selective uh, into the areas where you put your most resources. Uh, so you, be, you do begin to make those choices I spoke about earlier. Uh, and we all have to do that um, in terms of the ongoing cuts that everybody faces. I will mention briefly later how I think you may actually need to do more to do less. Um, uh, and you'll, we'll see if you agree or not. Public protection, then, is prevention, pure and simple. I think you are attempting to prevent the repetition of seriously harmful behaviour, usually from known individuals. That's our premise. You cannot prevent what you do not know. Um, no matter what the media implies, by its wonderful use, I think, of retrospective profiling. If we all read that, we should, there should be no crimes anywhere at all. A number of the recent school shootings in America uh, might have been prevented, according to news reports. There were obvious signs. In most cases, though, these signs were all very carefully hidden uh, and not obvious to anybody. Had they been, then yes, we should be concerned. So, public protection is about preventing the repetition of serious harm from known offenders whose future victims may or may not be known. It's a real puzzle, I think, in many ways. And of course, we cannot be sure at all that the predicted behaviour will recur. We don't know that. 
We're only looking at a probability that this person will rape that person, this person will shoot that person. We don't know they will, and, and often they don't. So, it's this world of un imponderables. <coughs> um, so, a lot is unknown. It's a world of uncertainty. Risk, I mentioned, and I, I'm really just going to briefly touch on this. <coughs> it's, uh, of course, a way of trying to reduce some of that uncertainty. Numerous tools have been developed over the years. Many of you will be familiar with one or more of them. Uh, risk, uh, risk assessment and risk management is, is an industry in itself, uh, I would say. Uh, we have basic tools and we now have those that inco incorporate more dynamic, fluid uh, information rather than simply relying on factual, actuarial or historic evidence. Even though uh, many of those simplistic ones often produce as good a results as the more sophisticated models that are around at the moment. Tools are also being uh, used to devise uh, the actual risk management process which follows the assessment. Uh, and this is no doubt of assistance, I think, to many people, not least those in the, the extended public protection family uh, who may be unfamiliar with offending behaviour. But look at Voltaire's words, um, which I have some sympathy with. Doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is an absurd one. It fits really well, I think, with risk assessment. Uh, Doubt uh, really does promote anxiety uh, in, in people making assessments, in, in people in probation, social work, policing, whatever. Um, it makes us strive uh, to make things firmer. We don't want the uncertainty. We want to firm up the situation. Uh, we need to have a clear plan, a risk assessment plan, uh, even to cover our backs. Because if we've done a good risk assessment and here's the plan, we've done what we can and in many ways uh, of course, that is true. Yet, if we believe in certainty, we seek to create, because we are trying to make certain the uncertain in the future, uh, it surely has its own disadvantages. If we accept one person as high risk, we accept another as low risk. We'll do that because that's what the scores uh, tell us. The problem is that can fix your minds. Uh, but risk does not fix at all. It moves, it changes, it is dynamic. Uh, and I do believe there is a problem with some risk assessment use. Not the risk assessment tools, but the way we believe what they tell us, perhaps, uh, that we don't think people can change. Uh, and, and we all know they most certainly do. But even if we, if we accept that, we will, um, of course, because um, it's a natural thing to do, allocate resources uh, according to risk. Highest risk, most resources, most skilled practitioners. We also know, though, that 80% of serious further offences um, are committed by low and medium risk offenders, those not having the best skilled, the best resourced teams or departments. Uh, in 2013-14, I think it's the only stat I'm going to use, uh, out of 174 recorded on a map of CASO, caseload, 174 serious further offences, 143 were assessed as needing only level one management uh, at MAPA, the lowest level. There were only three at level three, the highest level. You can take this two ways, I think. Either we've really got it right uh, with our assessment of high-risk offenders, because uh, there's only a few uh, serious further offences, or we've got it wrong, because all these offences are occurring in low and medium risk offenders. And I think it's up to you what you believe on that. Uh, people will choose to, to believe what they will. There's probably a bit of truth uh, in both. It worries me, though, um, if we have got it slightly wrong, that we haven't got resources and skills um, within uh, groups working with lower and medium risk offenders. I felt that for a very long time about the probation service. Uh, in its scant resources these days, it focuses all its high-risk resource on upper risk uh, offenders, all the problems uh, occur elsewhere. <coughs> a former Chief Inspector of Probation once produced a really good graphic uh, of a moving line and it was a series of colours from green up to red. Uh, what he didn't have was boxes because his view was you can't put risk in a box. It has to be fluid, it has to be dynamic, it can go up and it can go down and it can do that really quickly. 
We mustn't uh, also forget um, that our attempts to manage the future can have significant rights implications. Uh, oh, I think I may have missed a page. Do excuse me for a moment. I think I missed a slide. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that one later, I think. Uh, well, well, I've Whoever's in charge, can that all go back? <laughs> Please, and I'll carry on talking. Uh, it does have significance. That's it, that one? Brilliant, thank you. Significant rights implications. Um, the book there by Eric Janus, The Failure to Protect, talks exclusively about um, uh, a preventive state in America, how Americans have uh, managed to uh, try to uh, control the future in various ways, particularly sex offenders. We can look at the film there, a minority report, I'm sure many of you have seen it, where s f picking up signals for future crimes and trying to manage it, control it, eradicate crime, is taken to amazingly sophisticated levels. If you're judged by those standards, then heaven help you. Much better to turn to Judge Dredd, I think, who would be probably more useful in those circumstances. We do need to be careful uh, about how we, we use this. Hopefully I will now go to the right slide. Yes. Uh, just a very quick rip through some of the uh, current US um, methods of dealing with uh, sex offenders, just to see how far we might go down this road of trying to control and eliminate uh, risk. So we've got uh, five states requiring adult prostitution-related offences, 13 states for registering public urination. I told my students that this week. Go on holiday to America, be very careful where you go to we, because you'll be, you could well be on that register. Once you're on the register, of course, you're on the register. It doesn't matter if you're on there for going a we in public, you're on the register, the sex offenders register. Um, consensual sex between teenagers, exposing genitals in public. We may be, of course, uh, more sympathetic to that one. Um, a lot of exclusion goes on in America. We have Degrees of that here through MAPA. Uh, I like this one about the hurricane shelter. If a hurricane is blowing uh, in parts of America and you're a sex offender, you can't go into the hurricane shelter because there may be children there. Uh, this is serious stuff, I think. Uh, and, and now many um, uh, states require sex offenders to uh, report to the nearest prison uh, in the event of a storm rather than go to the nearest hurricane shelter. Uh, it, restrictions on where you can live in Miami. Uh, they find clusters of sex offenders under bridges because that's the only place where you can avoid some of the exclusion zones uh, that, that are happening over there. Uh, and just a few images, some of which are, are, are funny, some of which are not. Um, what I would recommend to you, if you're interested in it, if you haven't read it, is this. No Easy Answers by Human Rights Watch. Just type it in and it'll come up online. Um, it's just an exposure of sex offender controls in the United States. It's very, very interesting, uh, both in terms of what you learn about it and in terms of how this woman here, who uh, lost her son, changed her views about sex offenders once she uh, discovered a little bit more about it. Right. How am I doing? Five. Or oh, started late. <laughs> right. <laughs> Stand the ground. Um, what we're doing is coming to a view that certain behaviour has a chance of being repeated in the future, and we're taking action to prevent it. Where do we set the parameters? Recent obsession with sexual crime has seen 88 offences in the Criminal Justice Act 2003, triggering dangerousness assessments. We've become very used to uh, risk-based decision-making and accepting the scores on the doors, to quote Brucey. We've become quite OK about depriving people of their liberty based on a chance of them repeating their behaviour in the future. Uh, and we do this at both the sentencing stage and at the end of their uh, tariff in an indeterminate sentence. I use the word chance quite deliberately because these actions uh, are based on a probability score. But who determines the limits of the probabilities? Do we want to be absolutely sure or just about sure? Uh, more than evens. The answer to that, of course, depends to a certain extent on all of us and wider public uh, prevailing social attitudes and the extent uh, of what sociologist Frank uh, Freudy called a culture of fear. How afraid are we? 
The more afraid we are, the more we're prepared to accept. Risk is interesting, I think, because we've now developed a tendency to negative risk and forget its opposite, which might mean a chance or an opportunity. People play the lottery in their millions. The risk of losing is almost a certainty, but they play because there's a chance, a possibility, that it's going to uh, turn out nice. Uh, in dangerous terms, risk is generally negative. There's criticism of those who make positive risk decisions, such as the parole board or even the probation service. We have to defend the positive decision to release far more than we do um, to uh, sentence in a negative way. Unless we do this, unless we take chances, the system is not based on risk at all. It's based on punitiveness. Think about the SOR, Sex Offenders Register. This is a risk-based monitoring system, but based on two premises that aren't really risk-related at all. Uh, one is that nearly all sex offenders have to be registered, full stop. Uh, and two, that re the registration period is determined by the sentence, which may or may not have been risk-based. Yes, I know, we now have risk assessment for lifelong registrants, um, forced on the government by the Supreme Court, but the response was to set the minimum period for review at 15 years. What has 15 years got to do with risk? In my view, absolutely nothing. Um, what it did have was the minimum period since the register started to the date of the judgment, uh, and that's what the government chose. I feel the government was punitive in its response, political, uh, wanting to appear tough on a populist platform. That's my view. Any risk-based process needs to be regularly reviewed, otherwise it's not about risk at all. I said earlier you might be able to do more to eventually do less. 46,000 sex offenders registered, only 850 deemed to need multi-agency level 2-3 meetings. All those rest of them um, are registered for periods up to 10 years, triggered by a caution or any sentence up to 30 months. There is no review of their risk other than how many visits they're going to receive each year. There's no review to get them off that register. Even if they're down to one police visit a year, and there are thousands and thousands of them in that situation, think about the cost of that. How many could actually be deregistered? De now, many police officers might say even one visit a year, if you don't know when it's coming, is a good control method. True. If we're looking to save money, you can save an awful lot of money by bringing some of these people uh, off the register. So in trying to make the future certain, I think we too often strive for the unknown. I think it's public perception is framed by perceptions of innocence and deserving victims. It's been constructed around the notion of predatory, stranger danger. But if we're looking for more certainty, why not actually go with what we really do know? If you look at this really quickly, um, basically, it's what you all know. Uh, sexual crimes occur in places uh, w which are known with people who are acquainted or related. For example, two children die at the hands of their parents each week, yet we still see endless serious case reviews point to the same old lack of agency cooperation. Two women die at the hands of their partners and ex-partners each week. This continues to be framed as domestic, uh, with all that that entails, and slips outside of our understanding, I would say, of public protection. We know as many as 80% of those women uh, die in or near their homes. We know a lot about these victim groups. We know far more about those than we do the one the media constructs for us, which is the uh, abduction of an innocent child by a predatory stranger. We don't know much about that. We know a lot more about the other stuff. I'm going to pass over the uh, cost of a homicide, but you can save a lot of money by preventing deaths if it's possible to do so. <laughs> Briefly touch on the Ralph Ralph Moat case. I think it's a good example in terms of what I'm saying, who the public are. The public are children and uh, women in particular, and they're also gays and they're ethnic minorities, they're sex workers, uh, they're the homeless. I think we always need to remember that public protection is about protecting the public, not just some sections of it. So Rail Moat, I think is a good example, and I'm very, very close. Um, here we had very clear threats made to known victims um, with a man with a violent past and a declared access to weaponry, guns, and even explosives, he said. Uh, there were far more knowns than unknowns in this case. Yet it got caught up uh, in police and prison communications, or lack of them. Uh, it got caught up in decisions on grading intelligence sources, got caught up in the nature of the incident, which was labelled a potential domestic. 
What it was was a very clear threat of serious harm, where we knew quite a lot about the perpetrator and the potential victim. Getting it wrapped up in this stuff uh, resulted in deaths, um, which will lead me on to my probable last point on multi-agency working as quickly as I can. Just put the, uh, this case, the report's come up very recently. I'm sure the uh, killing of George uh, Williams, you would have read about that. Um, but if you, if you look at the headlines there, Porn Obsessed Killer was allowed to carry out the depraved murder of a teenage girl by uh, police officers and social workers. Uh, it's your fault, you know that, because that's what the media keep telling us. Um, writ large is this implication that you're not doing your job, uh, you allow things to happen, you didn't intervene. Findings invariably end up as a criticism of multi-agency working, usually of ineffective communication and in, uh, information exchange. The inevitable result of that is more regulation, more policy, even legislation, to make the system work better next time. Or new computer systems, as we're in the BT Centre. Uh, things will be developed to join us up better than ever. But these systems are now over 30 years old in parts of the country. Uh, I was working in multi-agency working in the 1980s, so I'm actually older than 35, but it has been going uh, for a long time. I actually do honestly believe uh, a variety of perspectives gives a much better picture of risk uh, and of offenders' uh, behaviour. I've got no doubts about that uh, whatsoever. But there are dangers. We need to make sure that in having a number of people and agencies involved, uh, we do not stop acting when we need to. We can't assume the next person, the next agency, will do it. Because they don't. We must also, in my view, be very, very careful about not forgetting what each agency distinctly and uniquely brings to the table. There is a danger that as agency boundaries blur, uh, so do roles and skills. Many police officers are called offender managers. When I researched them working as sex offender offender managers, I told them they sounded like more like old probation officers uh, than police officers. In fact, they even sounded more like probation officers than new probation officers. It was stunning to listen to them. Uh, interesting. It's meant to be multi-agency working, not mono-agency. The tragic case illustrated on the slide here uh, led to a 74-page report, highly critical of multi-agency working. Apart from, in my view, 74 pages being far too long to learn lessons from, what was clear is that some individuals within those organisations didn't perform as well as they might. They didn't fulfil their distinctive roles effectively. This was not about sharing information, which, yes, was a problem, but it was about individuals doing something with that information, which was their responsibility. There was a more detailed picture of Reynolds' offending behaviour, which could and should have escalated his risk status. And the police were in possession of that information. So you can keep oiling the chains, but it's useless if the, uh, the cogs are broken. I am now finishing. In summary, then, the public protection system, I think, in this country is very good in many ways, but it seems to fail with monotonous regularity in the same areas. Yes, we need to share uh, information. Yes, we need to take joined up decisions, but we also have to do what we're actually paid to do as individuals within those organisations uh, and to do it as well as we possibly can. We should use advances, advances sorry, in risk assessment as a guide, but not become slaves to the numbers. There are too many exceptions around gender, sex offenders, young people um, for us to believe this. We have to prepare to take risks and take the consequences. If we do not, the system will implode under the pressure of numbers and we end up making some very unpalatable decisions about who we protect uh, and who we don't.